Well, hello there and welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about how to close better quality clients at the pointy end of the deal. To kick things off, I want to welcome the people who are already part of our world. If you're a member of the B2B school or you're a client of B2B Dash, I want to say welcome. Uh, we love you. Uh, thank you for setting aside some time today to be part of this. If you're part of the B2B Summit, or indeed you're new to our world, welcome to you. Once again, thank you for setting aside the time. I don't know if you know this, but less than 0.01% of business owners invest in their education. That's right, 0.01%. But if you don't invest in your education, how the heck are you supposed to get ahead? Now today, as our guest star, as our lead presenter, I am thrilled to have with me my good my good buddy and partner in crime, John, the B2B hustler in Glasos. He is sitting in one studio in Sydney, Australia. I am in another place, Melbourne, Australia. But wherever you are joining us from, whatever corner of the globe, give us a holler, say hello, uh, and uh, let us know where you are from. But more importantly, let me pass to John, who's going to kick things off with a very important question. Johnny. Yo. So yeah, I want to start here today because as James spoke about, we're talking about the fast turnaround formula when it comes to the pointy end of the B2B sales cycle. And I want to start with this question. What's the hardest thing about selling complex services and big ticket projects and products? Chuck it in the chat. So tell me, what do you find the most difficult? What's the hardest thing for you when it comes to selling things that are complex? These things include things like knowledge products, you know, maybe where you're selling your expertise or selling your time. Maybe you've got something that takes a long time to sell. So what is it? Throw things in the chat. Let me know. And also it's, also, it's really important that you do participate. Even if this is a recording and you're watching a recording, if you're playing along live, there's no excuse. If you're watching a recording, write something down on a piece of paper or say it out loud. And the reason why is the more that you participate, the more value you're going to get from this. Because business, like life, is not a passive exercise. It's not for voyeurs. If you're not participating, uh, you're not getting value. And that's especially true with something like this. And that is because... The more you participate, the more likely it is that you are going to retain the information. And John's going to be dropping ideas and concepts and tactics and strategies like hand grenades. And if you're not participating, you're unlikely to retain that information. If you don't retain the information, you are unlikely to uh, take action. And if you don't take action, uh, what's the point really? Uh, when you retain the information and then you execute, you take action, you create momentum, momentum creates momentum. And then that's when cool things happen. So what are some of the things that ended up popping on the screen, John? Awesome. So Elaine says long sales cycle and a multi-touch attribution. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit today, especially the multi-touch side of things, but that is common for a lot of people when it comes to selling something. Um, Cam says in the past, it's been about reframing from talking about all the things that he does but instead trying to keep focus on outcomes, feelings, priorities. You've been around our training, haven't you, Cam? Uh, Monica says selling value. Totally. You know, there's always that client or prospect that says, I don't get it. You know, I don't see it. I don't understand it. Uh, Craig says finding their real pain point. Absolutely. Richard says getting the client on the same page, you know, understanding. I think, again, that comes down to the value, you know, really trying to appreciate what it is that you're selling and, and totally understanding it. Chris says communicating what it is clearly and succinctly. I've seen value here pop up a couple more times. I'm not going to read them all because they're coming in thick and fast, but obviously we can pick a couple of trends. We can pick a couple of trends. What do you think, James? Yeah, when we talk to a lot of our clients and over the years, we've directly helped hundreds, supported thousands, educated tens of thousands. Uh, there are a couple of big themes and I think John's got a couple on the screen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what it typically comes down to is one of these three things. And sometimes it's all of these three things, right? <laughs> but the first big thing here is, is the proposal, right? It's the idea of the damn proposal. Do they want it? right? Are they just being polite by hearing me out? What do we actually put in these proposals? Um, getting caught up in black art quoting, if you don't know what that term is, it's where you're trying to be 
everything to everyone. You know, you haven't worked out what it is you sell to who because someone says, I want a website, someone else says social media, and you just say, well, okay, I can work that out. So one of the things that causes problems is that damn proposal. I was going to say, put your hand up if you love writing proposals. Give me a yeah, and let's just watch crickets. Who likes who loves writing proposals? Yeah, give me a hell's yeah. yeah. I love writing proposals, especially for those people who I'm not even really quite sure really want a proposal because they say, yeah, can you just send me a proposal? <laughs> and you, is it an opportunity? Is it not? And then you go and you do your black art quoting. How much should I charge? What does the weather feel like today? Uh, how much money do they have? How much money do I need? There's no consistency. Yeah. The damn proposal. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's one of the things, right? The second big thing here is the constant chase. And a few people mentioned this in the comments, right? It's the follow-up. It's the long sales cycle, right? Trying to get the meeting in the first place. When they arrive with that eh, mindset, you know, they just don't really get engaged or it doesn't feel like they're involved. Postponements, reschedules, ghostings, right? And we've got prospects who say the right things and don't take any of the action. That constant chase, that constant, as you can see here, this guy running after someone on a bicycle, you know? Like we don't ever want to feel like that in sales, but a lot of people do. Yeah, we feel like we're chasing all the time when the opposite of that, and this is the destination that we would like you to take you to, and we've got a bunch of case studies and examples where our clients have gone on this journey where we flip the equation, and then that's when you become the prize. But the constant chase is often a multi-touch thing. There's elements which require manual emails and phone calls, and it does all sorts of weird things to our self-esteem and our egos over the longer term, and we'd... And we're not saying don't follow up, you know, uh, you've got to be able to follow up, but you need to be able to do it in ways where you're not necessarily feeling like you're pestering someone or you're yeah. feeling like you're desperate. Absolutely. In fact, following up is the main reason why people don't close deals, but there's a way to do it that serves you better than the way you're probably doing it at the moment. And so we'll talk about that in a second. And the third big thing here is fear of sales breath, right? I'm sure there, I mean, there'll be a lot of people out there who are afraid to sell. You know, they're afraid of coming off as being too salesy. You know, um, we all probably picked up a book written by someone in the 1980s and maybe back then that type of thing worked. But then you read it now and you say, oh, it's so cringy. Like it's, it's easy to feel afraid of it. But then on the flip side, it's also really easy to have that sales breath. So, you know, that comes down to failing to ask the right questions. You know, there's a way to frame things as a way to ask the right types of questions. Guess what the question is not? It's not how big is your budget? You know, but I know a lot of people in sales who ask that first. Mm. You know, they're unable to get decisions. You know, it's really hard to get people to move forward. And, you know, again, if you become afraid of selling or afraid of being salesy, you'll be afraid of selling. You won't close deals. So the question I have is, when it comes to these three things, the proposal, the constant chase, the fear of sales breath, how would it feel if you just knew all of this was absolutely taken care of? If you knew that every time you got someone into a sales scenario, you were not only going to have a high chance of closing that deal, but you were shortening the cycle, making life easy for yourself, all along the way, closing bigger tickets faster. Is that what you want? I want to hear I want to hear responses. So imagine for a yeah. second that someone reaches out and says, can you give me a proposal? And you don't roll your eyes. You give them a proposal because you know exactly what it is that you're going to put in it. Uh, you're not thinking, oh, what am I going to put in it? You're not doing that black art quoting. What's the magic number that I'm going to put on the back page? How would you feel if you weren't waking up in the morning and going, oh, who do I need to follow up? I've got to follow up that person. I don't want to follow that person up. I don't want to come across as a pest second guessing what if you just woke up and you knew exactly what you needed to do for each of your prospects in any given day how would that how would that feel uh what about that sales breath stuff what's the opposite of that imagine sitting down with someone and knowing that you are in the right place and they are in the right place you're not there to sell them you're there to deliver value because selling is serving and if there's a right fit at the end of that conversation, if you ask the right questions in the right order, they're going to come back to you and say, all right, well, how can we take this to the next stage? How would you feel? Give me, give us one word. It's really important. What we're doing here is we're future pacing. If you can't see where it is that you want to get to or you want to go, you fixate on the, on the place that you're at now. And then it becomes self-perpetuating. There's this weird thing about neural plasticity. When we're young, 
someone can just introduce an idea to us and we can immediately embrace that idea and adopt that idea and make it our own. As we get older, our neural plasticity decreases. Watch podcasts, listen to podcasts on this, watch YouTube videos on this. It's really amazing. But as we get older, we actually have to make the decision to change. You can teach an old dog new tricks, but the dog needs to have to have made the decision. So that's why I want to hear some of the words that you might be feeling. Uh, I see Ben has said confident. I see, see Fiona says awesome. Uh, Peter says good. That's not good enough, Peter. <laughs> I hope that you would be feeling better than good. And Cameron has also thrown in uh, confident as well too. How would that feel? Proposals sort themselves out. You're following up and you're doing it in a consistent, logical way. You don't feel like you've got sales breasts because you're sitting down at that meeting, shoulders back, lung full of air, full of confidence because you're there about to make a difference to somebody else's life. Love system, says Peter. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Lovely to, lovely to get your feedback. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's... Uh, it's it's tough, right? Sales is not an easy game. But for me, when I got this stuff sorted, and we're not going to talk too much about me today, but when I got this stuff sorted, it was actually relief. You know, walking into a sales scenario, not feeling like I was going to have to knock down brick walls, which I've also done in my life, but uh, not feeling like I was going to have to knock down brick walls of the prospect. So the big thing for me was this relief. You could just take it easy. You know, make it all about them and it's all good. So that's why today we're talking about these three outcomes, the offer, the systems, the soft skills. If you want to make your life easy at the pointy end of the deal, if you want deals that close themselves, if you want conversations that aren't full of objection, if you want to make life easy when it comes to getting the deal across the line, well, it comes down to nailing these three big outcomes and that is your offer, the systems that go with it and the soft skills that make closing easier. What I'm going to suggest right now is if you've got a phone, take a, take a, a photograph of this particular slide, the offer, the systems, the soft skills, pull it out, point it at the screen and take a photo of this particular slide. Now, John's going to go into all of these in quite a bit more detail, but this is a reference for you. This is a reference for two hours from now, for six hours from now, for 24 hours, 48 hours, six days from now, three months from now, six months from now, and you can look back and say, okay, well, that was really, really important. I spent my life thinking that sales was about the soft skills. It was about closing the deal. It was about locking them in. But John was able to demonstrate a different way and a different set of priorities. And I do want to point out that John's written this, the offer, the systems, and the soft skills. And in terms of nailing the pieces of the puzzle, the lion's share of your attention could, should go into the offer, then the systems, then the soft skills, not in that order. Because if you've got a clear and compelling offer, if you've got the systems to build trust and educate, you don't need yeah. the soft skills the same way. It's funny. The number one question I get asked by prospects when it comes to sales is how can I sell better? You know, they're not confident in the way that they deliver. They're not confident in the language they use. I've even been asked before, John, do you have a one-liner that helps you close deals? You know, and I often have to remind them that you know, it's not about, there's nothing you or I can do or say, you know, there's no one liner I can throw out that's just going to close the deal. And that's part of soft skills. And there's certainly a method to the madness. But as James said, the offer is the most important thing here, followed by the systems so that when you get to the stage where you have to use your soft skills, like you're just walking the red carpet, you know, and that's the point. The most common question I get, John, is what are your best ways of handling objections and the simple answer is, mm. is that if you have a compelling offer and you've built trust and rapport before the meeting, if you've run the meeting yeah. in a way to handle those objections before they even come up, you don't need to deal with the objections. That's the simple yeah. answer. For sure. All right, let's get stuck into it. Um, before we do, participation bonus as always, straight from the library and the brain of Mr. James Tuckerman uh, <laughs> for sticking around. Thank you for not discounting. You know why? I don't want to hear anyone ever tell me that they discount. Uh, you know, sales 101, do not discount. So participation bonus, you're going to get that for hanging out with us today. Participate, leave a comment, uh, yep. participate in any way that you possibly can. And uh, the outcome of that is 
is that when you are having a conversation with a client and they say, can you please sharpen the pencil or you can do a better deal? You're not going to cave. You're going to say, sorry, I don't offer discounts. I'm not going to pull the value down, but I can, I'm not going to pull the price down, but I can push the value up in this way. Would that make a difference? They say, yeah, you win the client without compromising. So that's a participation bonus. All you need to do is leave a comment. Like Fiona's funny line here. One liners are like pickup lines. <laughs> And insincere. We don't want yeah. them. Leave yeah. comments. If you leave a comment, participate, you'll get this sometime in the next 24 hours. Awesome. Oh, who's this guy? <laughs> who's this guy? Uh, this is John Inglesos. Uh Now, um, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to spend all day talking about us. Obviously, we want to be talking about you guys and gals uh, helping you with your headaches, your obstacles helping you get closer towards your aspirations and desires. But I think it's also important that you know who you are listening to today. It's always really important. Uh, there are a lot of online marketers out there that spend their time selling $17 eBooks from their parents' basement, right? And they've never met a client in the real world. That is not John Inglesos. There are people out there who have uh, cut their teeth in 1980s sales workshops talking about look within to lock them in and ABC always be closing. Once again, that is not John Inglesos. John Inglesos is a guy that, oh, how long have we known each other now? Uh, I think we worked this out the other day. We've known each other since I was 22 and wow. I was 30, so long, eight years. A long, a long time ago, a long time ago, right. <laughs> a okay, long cool. time ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask John some questions uh, and that will allow him to reveal a little bit about his background uh, and the world that he comes from. But we were just talking about three different things there, the damn proposal, the constant chase, and the sales breath. So the first question I'm going to ask you, John, is that um, you've, had, you've had over 400 uh, sales conversations uh, mm -hmm. over the last two or three years. Yeah. Uh, you've got a really high close rate. Um, we call John the B2B hustler. He does the hustle, so you don't have to. You can learn from his mistakes. Um, a typical proposal. How many pages are in a typical proposal in your world? Well, I tell you what. Um, I, by the way, I've read a lot of proposals from other people, and it always frightens me when someone sends me a forty-page bonanza. <laughs> um, a typical proposal in my world, honestly, three, four pages, five maximum. But more often than not, it's either one page or zero. No pages at all. No proposals at all. Um, you know, and I tell you what, the five page proposals that I have maybe only have 300 words in them, you know, tiny. Uh, how, says Elaine. We'll talk about that. We, we will talk about that. that. One thing I will say is that if you're delivering a billion dollar project with multiple deliverables and all the other stuff, uh, clearly there's going to have to be some degree of scope. But when we're talking about the core offer or the core proposal, it can be as, as, as little as, as one page. If you're yeah. selling something that's under ten thousand dollars, it can be as 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 as, as many as zero pages. Exactly. Uh, followed by an expectations agreement after Simon signs you. We'll come back to that. Just now that we've blown Elaine's world. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jacqueline. Uh, Jacqueline's one of the newest members of our community, yeah. B2B School, and one of the newest customers of B2B Dash. Wonderful to see you here. Um, the second question that I have for you is. This is a real case scenario. So this is just something that's happened in the last couple of weeks. John said, oh, I just closed, a, it was like a $9,600 deal, like a $10,000 deal. And he said, can you guess how many follow-ups were required? And we were like, I don't know. Everybody, give me a number. John closed a deal the other day, 9,600. We have a saying that the most reliable way to lose a client is failure to follow up. Johnny did his, did his bit and he followed up. Uh, Elaine says three follow-ups. On average, it takes five follow-ups to close an average B2B deal. Most people give up after just one follow-up. Heather said, Heather says zero follow-ups. Uh, Johnny, how many was it? 27. 27, 27 follow-ups. Now that's the opposite of what you thought that he was going to say because Johnny yeah. is king of the one call close formula. But the, the reality is the one call close formula is to set you up to get to a decision as quickly as you possibly can. Yeah. But there are still going to be situations where the prospect is just not ready, right? Sure. The only person who can close the client is the client. It's not you. And this was 27 follow-ups, which I think has got to be close to a record. 
Now, in my world, yeah. Now, now, John, if you had all, if all those twenty-seven follow-ups had been phone calls, face-to-face meetings, Zoom calls, carefully crafted, just bespoke emails, 27, 27 follow-ups, would, would it have even been worth signing the ten thousand dollar client? No way, because I know what my hourly rate looks like. And let me tell you, if I had to do that all manually, I don't think I'd be making the money back. Uh, you know, it's it's, uh, and that's the way you've got to look at it, right? Is your time, is your money? But um, you know, on the flip side, follow up can happen by harnessing the power of automation. And I'm going to talk about that today because 27 follow ups is not a problem. It's only a problem when you need to do 27 follow ups manually. Because as James said, the only person that can close the client is the client. Um, there's nothing you or I can say or do that can, you know, there's no Jedi mind trick that will tap into your brain. You know? uh, these are not the drones you are looking for. That doesn't exist here. These are not the drones you're looking for. <laughs> you know, but it doesn't exist here. So, the only person that can close the client is the client, uh, but there's a way to do that at scale. So we'll talk about that later. So Alison just left a comment. Unfortunately, John and I can see this, but she said that has to be a first, John. It was a first. Most people would stop or even forget. Just shows how, imp- just shows how important it is to have a system, uh, i.e. B2B Dash, which is the system that I think Alison uses. And it's also yeah. the system that John uses. Um, okay. Uh, my, uh, my third question. Uh, what was the third question? Uh, sales breath. All right. Mm -hmm. How do you overcome? Everybody's had this at some point. It's called imposter syndrome. We walk into a situation. We're thinking, do I have what it takes? Or we might be feeling needy because we need to win the client or close the deal. How do you overcome this terrible fear of sales breath coming across it, feeling like you're coming across as salesy? Well, I tell you what, let's be, but let's be frank. The first thing is you got to have confidence in what you're selling. So, you know, if, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the term fagazi, you know, it's an old, uh, old Italian term, it means a fake, right? And so like you could have a diamond or you could have a fagazi diamond, which is not real. And if you're trying to sell a fagazi, if you're trying to sell something that you don't feel confident is the real deal, you're never going to overcome sales breath. And this is why the offer is so important. But I guess it, what it really comes down to is just the systems and the structure, you know, um, I, I've consulted so many salespeople that are afraid of selling. And they often ask me for scripts and scripts are really unnatural and a really hard way to do things. The moment we put just a framework in front of them and James is going to talk about the framework today. I'm going to talk about the framework just by having a framework in front of you. You can start to overcome the idea of sales breath, but it really does come down to now the offer as Fiona just said, uh, she said it to all panelists, but belief in your offer is so important. So if you believe in your offer and you believe in your ability to deliver on that offer, but then you got a framework to make selling easy, you know, if you knew you were walking into a frictionless sales conversation rather than one that was full of friction, you know, flow rather than friction, perhaps it makes your life easy. So it's also about setting up things before the meeting so that the meeting is so much easier for you. So who was this John Inglisos guy? He was a he was a guy that had never thought that he was going to go into sales, became a bricklayer, uh, yeah. couldn't, you know, his back was about to break being a bricklayer, decided to set up his own digital marketing agency, quite literally made all the mistakes that you could ever imagine. But yeah. he built it up to an agency turning over about half a million dollars within a matter of years. Uh, we managed to cross paths one day. That's a story for another day. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, the rest has been history. So that is this guy, John Inglesos. He's not some teenager in, a, in his parents' basement trying to help you sell e-commerce products. He's not some sleazy sales trainer from the 1980s. He's a guy that firmly believes, like I do, that, that selling is serving. It's about the transfer of certainty. It's not by about trying to convince people to do things that they that they don't want to do, don't need to do, or, or are not ready to do. Excellent. Awesome. Well, with that, uh, you know, ego float out of the way because that was very, very good. You said it better than I would. Let's get stuck into it. And I want to know who agrees with this statement, right? Give me a, just give me a yes or a no. The purpose of the offer is to give the prospect the freedom and autonomy to make the decision. Someone give me a quick yes or no. We're going to breeze through this quickly. The purpose of the offer is to give the prospect the freedom and autonomy to make the decision. I see Ben said, yeah. Elaine said in capital letters, yes. Peter says, yes. Cameron says, yes. Well, I tell you what, that's only one half of the equation because the purpose of the offer is to give the prospect the freedom and autonomy to make the decision. But guess what? If my slide goes within the constraints, 
that you have created. I want to talk about this for 30 seconds. I had a prospect recently that I was talking with who then became a client. Do you know the biggest challenge they brought to me was? The fact that black art quoting was such a big problem for them. And again, black art quoting is we don't know what price to put on things. We don't know what services we're selling. Their business could not scale because they were a business coach who also did websites, who also did social media management, who also did tax returns for their clients, right? So it's about selling within the constraints that you have created because then if you've got a framework and a system and an offer, you can build on that. You can scale your business. And the biggest problem I have is that most people don't have constraints. Yeah. So someone comes in the door and they've got a checkbook book and a pulse. Uh, the only qualifying factor is if they breathe, if they breathed on a mirror, it would fog. That's the, that's the, the only qualifier that they have. So someone says, can you get me a proposal? And they get busy. The purpose of the proposal is to give the other person the freedom and the autonomy that they need to make a decision. Uh, but however, within the constraints that you have created. So let's talk about constraints. Yeah, absolutely. So constraints, right? Comes down to these three really key things. Chunking down, packaging up, and what I like to call three-tier pricing. So let's first talk about chunking down. Chunking down is about taking everything it is that you do across the board that you want to be doing, by the way. So if you want to be a business coach and you don't want to do people's tax returns, you're not going to put that on a list. But what you need to do is you need to look at the entire breadth of what you do and create this big list, this big list of, of items that you know you could use if you were to start creating packages. So chunking down is taking everything and finding out what all of the things are, the things that you can go ahead and offer. Packaging up is then about taking these things grouping them together, give them a name, give them a price, right? It's about taking everything that you can offer and pulling them into a set of packages. So now you've got constraints when you're offering to someone something that you're going to sell. But then three-tier pricing is the thing that people miss the most because then they have one offer and it's one cracker offer. But what's the problem with just having one offer? What's the answer that someone can give you? James, it's, not really, it's not really one offer, is it? If I say you've got yeah. this one offer, they've actually got two options. Yeah, yes or no. And we don't want yes or no to be the two options. So we use three-tier pricing, at least have two options, but three options, three-tier pricing, so that you're giving someone a yes, yes, or yes style opportunity. So can we drill down this a little bit deeper? So chunking down, you said grab all the different things that you do and create a really long list of all the different things that you do. Yeah. Uh, is that like pulling together a rate card? Bingo. Yeah. So if you were to pull up, if you were to pull apart absolutely everything you do, you can now give it a price and then you can go ahead and create that rate card. So that when someone asks you, all right, can you do this or can you do that? It's as simple as there is a rate card there. You've got a way to price that and price that in, which again, takes away the idea of black art quoting. So it's not just a random number we're plucking out of the sky. To ask a really common question that I get asked all the time, if I have a rate card, should I share that rate card with my clients? Or more specifically, people say to me, when should I share my rate card with my clients? So when should I share my rate card with my clients, John? Well, I don't typically share it with them at all like, uh, until I get to the point where, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, because uh, for me, I keep it, it's in my pocket, but it allows me to structure a deal that makes sense for them rather than try and give them 17 different options, because sometimes, you know, it's very easy for people to look at that without context. So by the way, here's a tip. When someone asks you for a proposal and they don't have context, never send it, book a call, explore. Don't just send a proposal because there's going to be no context there. So I personally don't hand it over, but you might hand it over when you've already got a client that you're working with. They're an existing client and now you're looking at upsells or cross-sell opportunities. At that point, there's trust there, there's faith in you. But when you give them a big list of 17 things before there's faith in you, I mean, you're not going to close someone. So we're going to, so you chunk it down. You look at all the different things that you do. We have a process that we work through, which is called the value matrix. And that there is having a look at everything that you do, which are the things that are that you do that are delivering dramatic impact to your target audience that don't take much time, which means that they're great for you. They don't take much time and deliver amazing impact. That's amazing. At the other side of the equation, you might be doing things that take a lot of time and deliver very little impact. And you need to remove them from your service offering. 
but yeah. chunk down what it is that you do in the form of a rate card. Then you said package them up. Package them up in 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 what in what way or what context here? Yeah. So what I do when I'm looking at packaging up, now I'm creating groupings. So I'm trying to work out if I've got something I want to offer someone, perhaps at an early stage of our relationship, maybe there are certain things that I can do uh, to provide like a short-term product or an introductory product. That's an example of packaging up. Another example of packaging up might be what would be part of, I don't know, people might call it an ongoing scope of works or a retainer. What does that package look like ongoing? But what I like to do is I like to name it so that I can price it. Because what people don't do is they just say, well, we've got a retainer and it's this amount per month. No, don't, don't say everything. that. And you yeah, get everything yeah, and you get that. my time. Yeah, that's the worst thing to do is you're going to get my time. Instead, if you can package things up and then give them a name, you can give it a price, but it becomes tangible. It becomes about the outcomes more than it does become about oh, uh, John's going to dedicate 16 hours this month and you know what, I want to save some money, so I'm going to ask for 10 instead. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I mean by packaging up. Or they say, I've got 16 hours with John, so I better spend them. And then John ends yeah. up doing things that is a, the type of job that should be done for yeah. a 30, $30 um, freelancer or something like that. Uh, packaging up for me is, uh, John used the word groupings. Uh, I used the word buckets. So for example, you might have different target audiences and you might have a package for this target audience, a package for this target audience and a package for this target audience. Or indeed, if you're wanting to embrace three tier pricing, you might have three packages for this target audience, three packages for this target audience and three packages for this target audience. And that way um, uh, you can give them a package that, reflects their headaches, their obstacles, their aspirations, their desires, rather than book some time with me. You are selling outcomes, things, and then feelings. The package could be named to reflect the outcome that they're getting. The units within the package are the bits that that give it some some substance and some guts, but they're really paying for the outcome because at the end of the day, people don't give a damn how you get to the destination as long as you get there. And then feelings, uh, which is just constantly reminding people how they would feel if they uh, if they got that specific outcome, which is a little yeah. exercise we did a little bit earlier. Yeah, for sure. Now I want to mention uh, again. Jackie said this on all panelists only, um, but uh, if you can see what she said, she said most people pick the middle option when it comes to three tier pricing. I'll talk about that really quickly. So when it comes to three tier pricing, I like to look at this way: the Patsy, the preferred, the premium. And so the Patsy is usually like a watered down version of what it is you offer. Someone's meant to look at that as kind of like, you know, the cheapest bottle on, a, on the list at a, at a, you know, at a wine bar, right? It's kind of like no one wants the cheapest bottle because if you just pay a little bit more, maybe the preferred, the middle one, that there is the really good quality one. On the flip side, you've got the premium and the premium is about a topic we call anchor pricing. I'm not going to get into that today, but big numbers make smaller numbers feel even smaller. If someone said to you, I've got a $10,000 option, but I think the $1,600 option is better for you. People are going to justify the dollar figure on the $1,600. I just really quickly want to address as well what Elaine said on to all panelists, but she says, do you ever give an hourly for things not on the menu? That's black art quoting. You know, that's the idea of that's black art quoting. What you need to do is you need to have that menu. You can't scale a business not knowing what you're going to sell. Elaine, you say, what outcome are you wanting? And they say, I want this outcome. Yeah. The back of your brain, you might go, that's going to take three hours. You know what your hourly rate is. So it was like $300 an hour. And then you come back and you say, okay, well, for that particular outcome, it's going to be $997 because you're thinking there's probably 97 bucks in admin fees. And then there's three hours at 300 bucks an hour. And that person is not buying you for you, not buying your time alone. They're buying an outcome with a thing so that they can get their feeling. Massive out. difference. Massive difference. Yeah. So that's the constraints. So let's move on. Case study, Navy. James, did you want to talk about Navy? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Naomi's been a part of our world for quite some time. She signed up for a training product of ours called uh, called The Recipe, and then she moved into another training product of ours called The Pointy End, which I'll share a little bit of information about that a little bit later if anyone on the call is interested in continuing to work with us beyond the call today. But uh, Naomi was a freelance copywriter, all right, selling her time, selling time for money, right? 
And someone would call up and say, hey, can you do some copywriting for me? She'd schlep over to their house and they'd say, I want you to do this job. And uh, I've only got $600. And she'd go, yeah, I can do that in X many hours or whatever. And you just take the work, right? So we talked about constraints. So when it comes to your proposal, we start with constraints. One of the most powerful constraints that you can add to your, your, your marketing mix is clarity around your target audience. You say, I work with these types of businesses, not with these, not with these. I work with these because these are the businesses that I can deliver the best results for. So Naomi acquired clarity around her target audience and uh, that was course creators. And that allowed her to um, reframe what she was doing to reflect the actual needs of the target audience. So rather than saying, I'm a freelance copywriter, she could create a set of products which is specifically designed to give a course creator ROI. That also allowed her to pack up her vast range of uh, services as things. Uh, Fairly quickly, she began to attract better fit clients who valued her services more, right? Because they were getting an outcome, a big outcome. Uh, She built a waiting list. Uh, She doubled her rates, then she doubled them again. Uh, As she says here, I went through the process you teach and I restructured my offer. Tick. Not only did I close the next two sales calls, with new clients without an ounce of sales pressure. I made a record sale for my business. I doubled my rates. It was my biggest client spend ever. And that has been um, a scenario for Naomi, I think twice or maybe even three times since she entered our world. She doubled her rates, doubled her rates, doubled her rates. And that came from having a very clear offer, having the systems, having the soft skills at the end. So as an example, you can see on the screen on the left, There's an example of a three-part proposal. Now, if I squint really, you know, if I squint, I can see the prices that she had on her three pages here, right, for a three-part proposal. The reality is that she posted this three-part proposal in the Facebook group, uh, our private online community, and everyone came back and said, you're not charging enough. You need to be charging more. She doubled some of her rates and closed her biggest ticket item within about, I don't know, within about three weeks of that. What was yeah. also cool about Naomi being able to chunk it down was when you chunk things down, you begin to identify standalone products and services within your broader mix. So Naomi was able to go, hang on, I've got this little bundle of things that I'm already doing for clients right now. She created a graphic that you can see on the screen and now she's selling that small bundle as a standalone productized version of her skills and knowledge. So that is a a real example of a way to be able to scale your business by distilling down what it is that you do into a product that can be sold with very little or no effort on your behalf at all. So future clients do not want to buy your time. I hate to say it, they don't. No one values their own time. Very few people value their own time. Only about 1% of people actually value their own time. The real real people are playing a, a bigger higher next level game. They're the ones who value their time. And if most people don't value their own time, how are they supposed to value your time, right? Uh, So they just don't do it. What they want when you're speaking with them is they want to buy outcomes. So when you're packaging your stuff up, you're packaging up time as a thing which boosts the certainty. It's not I'm getting 16 hours with John and it's a good day or a bad day. You know, they're thinking, I'm going to get access to a thing, which is a process, which gives me certainty because I can see the structure, I can see the format. And if I work with this person through this process, I'm going to get this specific outcome. It's a completely different conversation and it's a much better one to have. Hey, John, you were talking, we're having a conversation this morning about Troy Eady. Yeah. Um, Do you mind telling that story just before we hit record? Yeah, for sure. So, um, we had a client named Troy Eady and Troy went through a lot of our training. The biggest thing for Troy was that he didn't, he, he often offer his time for free. So he'd be having conversations with people and he'd sell the next step, which was the idea of spending, you know, 45 minutes with him over the phone to workshop some sort of idea. Uh, and he had, you know, he was okay doing that. He didn't mind doing it, but he didn't get a lot of buy-in beyond that. And once he went through our training, the penny drop moment hit for him because he was talking about outcomes and talking about feelings in the framework of the things that he was offering. And all of a sudden he got to the end of his first sales call and he said to himself, if I say that my 45 minute session is free, I'm going to sound like a dumbass." 
So he plucked a number out of the sky and the number was 1600 bucks. And what do you reckon happened next? Yeah, well, next time, he, instead of saying, hey, let's have a private strategy call and I'll give it for free, he ran through outcomes, things and feelings. Yeah. Here are the outcomes you're going to get. Here's what we're going to run through. These are the feelings. And how much did, what, what was the number? 1600 like that. 1600 bucks like that for a session, you know, because he went through outcomes, things and feelings rather than, all right, well, we can spend some time together talking about a bunch of stuff that you may or may not want to talk about. The reason why John and I were talking about this this morning before we hit record is that this is this also happened in another part of our world this morning. This is an evolution of this process called getting paid to pitch. So another client of ours called Ben Cusack, he uh, he used to give away his sales calls for free and he posted in our Facebook group saying that over the last six weeks, he's made $2,000 doing sales calls. So mm. people are buying, they're spending money for him to do it, but it's because he's reframed what he's doing in a slightly different way. Okay. That is next level stuff. And maybe we can save that for another day, but uh, let's move on to systems. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to oh, systems. I knew but before, we get there, <laughs> <laughs> before we get there, I think the big thing we've identified here is that less is more. And you know what? I want to bring up Elaine's comment right now, because I think this, this puts this into perspective. She says that what happens if you can't deliver the results they want? So if they want, you know, a, a webinar or something, what happens if you can't deliver what they want? Well, the reality is, Elaine, less is more. Again, if you want to scale your business, if you want to take your business from here to here, you can't be everything to everyone. Stay in your lane and you'll get to your destination faster. Less is more. So it was a perfect time to bring up this, uh, perfect time to bring up this slide. Yeah, so if you're pulling together your package, and in the case with Elaine, it sounds like she's going to help people with pulling together a webinar. She can say, uh, it's, the, it's the webinars for startups package. And I'm going to run through all the steps that you need to do to put on a webinar, right? You're not going to put on the webinar. They're going to put on the webinar, right? You can help them work through the steps. Less is more. You're not promising the world. You can point out to them the statistics. You can give them the... Uh, the, the selling at scale, the benefits of selling at scale. You can run through that process, but less is more. Work through this process, put on your own webinar because the first time you do it, it will be terrifying. But once it's done, how are you going to feel? You're going to feel like you've, uh, you've climbed a mountain, even if you don't make a sale off that first webinar. But then the second webinar and the third webinar, just got to be realistic. We're not selling. No one, no one can sell. There is no such thing as a get rich quick, you know, product or service that, that, that anyone can sell. Uh, I once met James Dyson, inventor of the Dyson vacuum cleaner, and he told me how to get rich quick. Are you ready? He said, you work really hard for 11 years <laughs> and then all the bits, of bits and pieces fall into place and then you get rich quick and now he's a billionaire. Um, that's the way it works, but uh, selling less is more. All right, yep. systems. Now let's get into systems. So... <laughs> The purpose of this system is to what? Is to give the prospect the information and context to make the decision before you've even started the sales conversation. And I want to take what Rob said. Rob's a student of ours. He's been in our world for a long time. I'm loving it when a prospect has gone through my funnel and they're pre-sold before I even start to talk. So let's just think about that with slightly more context. Before you have even started the sales conversation, if you knew someone was coming into that sales combo and some of their objections have been answered and they're feeling like you're the prize and they know why they're there and they're there for all the right reasons and they've got the cash and they've got the intention, how would you feel knowing you were going to walk into that scenario? The interesting thing about that, hit us back the last slide, right? Yeah. The, right the last one. It says the purpose of the system is to give the prospect the information and context they need to make the decision. There are a bunch of people in this call right now. They're going, isn't that the purpose of the offer, the proposal, to give the information and context to make the decision? No. The offer is to give them the freedom and the certainty and the autonomy. The system before is going to give them the information and the context so that when you introduce the offer, it's a complete no-brainer because all your education has been, has, has been done. Um, and that's uh, what... I think Jay Abram was calling pre-selling well mm -hmm. even before the advent of the uh, of the of the interwebs. Yeah. So let's um, have a look at some examples of systems. Yeah. So in our world, like as a minimum, this is what we want to see our clients set up, and it comes down to five basic stages. 
And anyone can do this if they've got the right tools, by the way. Anyone can do this if they've got the right tools. This is not rocket science. This is not hard if you've got the right tool set. But the five basic stages look like this. Number one, it's about a lead gateway. You obviously need a way to collect leads. The worst thing you can do is, you know, fire stuff at social media and throw things on your website and not have a way of taking that person, that stranger who has no idea who you are, and turning them into a lead that you can follow up with. So the first thing is first, you need to be able to collect leads and that makes all the difference because then you can get into a scenario where you can start to nurture them. The second thing is the pre-follow qualification form. Now, um, Marie said something interesting. Free discovery session seems to be the norm. Yeah, although we're not going to talk about naming that today, but try and come up with a better name. Try and think about outcomes. Try and think about the purpose. But that's what we're talking about here. The, in my world, I have what's called a B2B funnel mapping session. And it's quite clear what someone's going to get out of that. That's the sales call, yeah? But it's a 45-minute funnel mapping session. And the point of having the pre-qualification form is to filter people in, but of course, filter people out, the people that you can't help. So the second thing here is if you've got a set of leads, you want to be able to filter them into a sales conversation. You want to have absolute context. Once they're in that sales conversation, well, great, you need a pre-qualification form. The third thing you need is, an, is the ability to take a booking. Uh, you don't even have to say yes or no to this, but I'm sure a bunch of people are going to say yes. Have you ever been caught in the back and forward? Oh, I'm free Monday at 5 p.m. Oh, I can't do Monday. How about Wednesday at 3.45? No, I've got to pick up the kids at 3.45. Can we do uh, seven months from now? <laughs> like that's, that's where it ends up. And so if you don't have a booking form to be able to take those leads, pull them into your calendar so that you can have a slot of time which, by which you're going to have that conversation, you'll actually never find yourself having the conversation. Um, the reason why it says here we need to make that measurable is because if we know the number, then we can work out our conversion rates so we can take the next step. Elevate anticipation is the fourth thing. This actually comes down to this context that James was just speaking about. Elevating anticipation is the countdown or count up sequence to that appointment. The emails that you can send prior to that appointment to get people ready and primed for that appointment. What do you think I do in mind? I have four and all the way through, I'm not just planting seeds, but I'm removing objections. In fact, my last uh, video in that sequence even says, I am going to be tempted to pitch you in today's call. You know? I'm, I'm taking away those objections before anyone gets there. So that's what we mean by elevating anticipation, the series of steps that happen before someone has an appointment. And then, of course, it's the meeting, but ideally getting paid if you can have a one call close or taking a deposit so that you can move into the next stage. So those are the five basic stages that you need in every system. And if you've got the tools, it's a piece of cake. So the tools you can actually see on the screen right now, bottom left, how to book more conversations with very interested prospects. That's an example of a lead gateway. It's going to collect a lead. Redirects to a qualification form. Hey, do you qualify for a funnel mapping session with John? Now, he's, it's not, hey, let's catch up and explore ways that I can take your money. Or let's do a discovery session so I can mine you for all the information that's in your brain so I can sell you better. It's not, let's do a breakthrough call so we can break through into your bank account. Um, <laughs> It's outcomes, things, and feelings. Target audience is B2B. Outcome is the funnel mapping. Uh, it's a session. There's a couple dot points in there, grab attention, all these other things. So that people know what they're getting, outcomes, things, and feelings. Redirects to the booking form. They can book a form. They can book a time that works for them. There's not this back and forth. This is elevating um, not only anticipation, but it's elevating John as the prize. So rather than, hey, when's good for you? When's good for you? John is the prize. They need to book time with John because John is the oracle, right? That they're gonna, that they're gonna, that's gonna help them get to the next level. After that call, very important, have these messages that put context, uh, elevate anticipation, make sure that they don't keep postponing, rescheduling, or even ghost you. The only people that ghost John are the types of people that were never gonna buy from him anyway because those four messages make it clear what this is about. Yeah. So that's fine. And then this last piece would a lot of people overlook because they're in B2B and they're used to giving people an invoice. Um, we don't play the invoices game where we, where we write invoices, we send invoices, we expect people to get paid. We follow them up when their invoice doesn't get paid. We hire a factoring company to get paid because our invoices aren't getting paid. 
We don't play that game and we recommend to our clients that they don't either. And uh, we use the one tool that does all this, creates the lead gateway, creates the prequel form, the booking form, the email follow-up, and even the cart pages. So that where you, when you're on the call, and this happened to John at um, about 5 a.m. this morning, at the end of the phone call, the person said, listen, I can't commit now. And John quite literally said, can, can you commit $100? And they said, yes, we can. So he said, great. And took $100 then and there. And that person is now committed to the next yeah. level, even though it was only $100, $100 that they put down. Amazing. So they're the five basic stages. Yeah, it makes all the difference. And, you know, these five things, these five stages are not hard to come up with. People are afraid of systems. They're afraid of technology. I want to illustrate this. These are not hard things to accomplish. And many people have accomplished them in, in under a day, right? But what do you think is the hardest part about pulling all this stuff together? Guys and gals, the hardest thing about automation. Yeah. Are you a passionate user of automation? Have you been dragging your feet? Do you, are you doing bits of automation, but you'd like to be better at it? What's the hardest thing about automation? Mari wrote to all panelists, uh, writing the copy. Now, if you want to leave a comment that everyone can see, I'll leave it for all panelists and attendees, but uh, Mari wrote, writing the copy. What are, what's the hardest thing about automation? What else, what else have we got? Uh, once again, the more you participate, the more you will get out of our time together today. Once again, we also have this wonderful thing called a participation bonus. You only yeah. get that when you participate. So Libby just participated for the first time. Well done, Libby. You get the participation bonus. She says, not knowing where to start. Heather said, getting all the content together. Yeah. Um, I find for me, one of the things is all these conflicting opinions. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need a Facebook group. You need blah, 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 all these different stuff. And the reality is, is John has just shown five things, uh, yeah. five, five things that you need. And if you can assemble them in reverse order, you're miles ahead than just about 90% of anyone else in your industry. Ben says, setting up the milestone. So we're tracking and measuring. Jacqueline said, connecting all the API pieces in one seamless flow. That's not a problem if, you're, if they're all in the one tool, by the way. Monica, making sure it always works. Yeah. Uh, Elaine, keeping track of what to do with people who enter, enter mid-funnel. All right. Interesting. Uh, Elaine, if people are entering mid-funnel and you're using a tool to track the steps, like they enter mid-funnel, like they book a meeting, that there is a tracking moment. So it can be tracked. It can be can be monitored. What's the hardest thing about automation? What do you find to be the most common thing, John? I tell you what, it's this. Most people have unfortunately signed up for a series of tools, four, five, six, seven, eight tools. Then they're starting to complain I think, about things like pulling together bits and bobs and APIs and what do you do? And I call that a Franken funnel. You know, Frankenstein... You know, uh, Dr. Frankenstein operated on this hybrid oh. machine man, whatever, the corpse thing. And yeah. it's just bits and bobs of different things. And of course, it wasn't going to function the way it needed to function. And if the legs failed, then the, the corpse didn't work. You know, this is what most people have done. They've overcooked it. They bought this tool and that tool and this tool and that tool and this tool and that tool. And they're trying to put it in a blender and say, this is going to make the sweetest apple juice of my life. It doesn't work that way. Instead, what you need is a Swiss Army knife. And most people don't look at the idea of a Swiss Army knife because the assumption is it's too expensive. Now, of course, we've got to counter to that. But one thing I want to say is this. If you tally it up, every single individual tool that you had, maybe it's only $8 a month and $15 a month and $17 a month and $29 a month. And then the time it takes you to put it all together and then the time it's going to take you when just one piece fails, tally all that up. And then compare that to what you might be able to do with a Swiss Army knife. Uh, it makes uh, it makes a world of difference. So that's what I find is the biggest problem. So Linnell says learning the tech. It's much easier to learn one tech tool than it is to learn yeah. 17. And by the way, both, most of the tools are not $12 and $15. Most of the tools are $99 and $49 and $149 and all those other on all those other things. So we're actually going to help you out with that in, in a little bit, but not now. We actually have a Swiss Army tool that we're going to be introducing, Swiss Army knife that we're going to be introducing yeah. you guys and gals to as part of uh, as part of a little bit of an, an upgraded offer that we have today if you'd like to continue working with us. 
Groovy. Uh, and what does this come down to? This one didn't trip me up this time. Less is more. <laughs> Less is more. Five stages, one tool. If you want to do this stuff properly, don't overcook it. You don't need these crazy long funnels that are uh, 17,000 steps. Um, you don't need five or six or seven or eight different specialist tools. Less is more. Find one, get your groove going in one tool to, to try and accomplish one specific outcome and use those five stages to get there. So less is more. Let's move on. Last, the purpose of soft skills is to do what? I want someone to type, type this out. So when I talk about soft skills, I mean the things that happen in a call, right? The things that happen in a face-to-face -face sale, in a sales call, in a Zoom call. What do you think the purpose is? You know, what, why do we need to have these soft skills down pat? What's the purpose? It's to do what? So you're on the phone with a prospect or you're on a Zoom call with that hot lead you're meeting face-to-face -face in a coffee shop. And I am curious about whether anyone's going to throw down the most obvious response. The purpose of the soft skills is to do what? You seem to be a, a fairly enlightened and switched on people, bunch of switched on people, because most people, the first word that's going to come to their mind it begins with an S and it ends with an E-L-L -L, and it's a four letter word. The purpose of soft skills is to do what M most people, whether you said it out loud or not, most people will imme immediately think is to sell something, right? That's what it is. Yeah. That's why I'm doing the call. Fortunately, Livia said, educate. Elena said, uh, uh, help people understand them. Jacqueline said, build trust and rapport. Uh, ben said, smooth the road. Mari said, establish a, connection uh we have a fairly definitive answer and this might also be one of those moments where you pull out your phone and you take take a photo of the screen the purpose of the soft skills is to do what well selling is about serving because do not forget that you cannot close the prospect the prospect closes themselves we're creating the environment that allows the prospect to feel confident right? To feel this, you know, this transfer of certainty that they're going to get the result that they're looking for, the outcome that they're looking for, the goal that they want to be. So selling, as many of you have rightfully said, and maybe it's because you've spent five days with us now learning about this stuff, but it's, it's about serving. It's about educating. It's about transferring certainty to the client or the prospect so that they can feel that they're making the right decision. I just want to take something that Kath said. Now, Kath um, was actually someone who worked with me privately in one of our premium programs. And Kath says this, I am closing as early as the first conversation. I just had my best month ever. Plus, I signed my first international client. Borders have become meaningless. My client base has exploded thanks to your training. I want to give this a little bit more context because I work with Kath privately. Kath used to be afraid of selling. Kath hated selling. Like she genuinely hated it. She used to run discovery calls. And the big thing she came to me to say was, I just can't get people to pull the trigger. And she was actually one of the first people that said to me, can I have a set of scripts? You know, and once we broke this down and made it more about the offer in the first place, with the right chunking and the right outcomes and feelings, the right price point, something that was going to serve her clients and serve herself. The moment we put the systems in place, including everything from collecting the lead to nurturing the lead all the way through to what happens before someone gets into the call, which was no longer called a uh, discovery session. It was now called an authority mapping session because what her clients wanted the most was to feel like they had more authority in their target space. And then the moment we got the soft skills right and we created structure around the call so that she could truly serve and transfer that certainty, there's testimonial right there. So the name of the name of the call is an authority mapping call. Outcomes, things, and feelings. Yeah, right? that's what that's that she could she could break that down. So I said, what's the purpose of soft skills? And you come up with some great words: uh, rapport and trust and education. Uh, the purpose of soft skills is to serve. Selling is serving. It's your job to serve. When you serve, you teach, uh, you transfer certainty, and that's when the per the only person who can make the decision can make the decision. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be over to you before we get there. Take some of the epiphanies, ah or do you like it too fast? Yeah. So what we'd like you to do is quickly give us some of your take homes and epiphanies. And uh, before I deliver a mini lesson on soft skills, 
And the reason why we'd like you to deliver us the take your take homes and epiphanies and aha moments right now is that there's this awkward moment where I have to say, John, can you give me the screen? You haven't given me the screen. Your hands are up in the air. Your hands should be down there. Uh, so can you shop, stop sharing your screen so that I can share yeah. the screen? But give us your take homes and epiphanies and aha moments that you've yeah, uh, for sure. in the presentation right now. John can yeah. read them out while I uh, get my stuff sorted. Yeah, so I'm going to let James do his thing, but let's talk about this. So Jackie says, reframing selling and serving. It's so important, you know. Um, that's what we're here to do. Now, we're still here to do it within our constraints, right? But, but selling is serving. Ben says selling the outcomes and not the time. Super important. Guys, I used to run an agency and when I was, uh, when the agency was in a infancy i used to sell nothing but time you know this amount of hours in a retainer and one or two things would happen people would try and take more hours than they could get or try and throw in other services to say oh we've got six hours left uh, we don't have any more of these activities can you do this stuff instead i would oblige because i had to um or on the flip side they try and reduce the reduce the time uh james just drew a smiley face hopefully everyone can see that if everybody could see what it was that i what i was uh, wearing and it means cool. that it Marie says, renaming the discovery call, but so many aha moments. I'm so glad. I'm glad. That's what we're here to deliver to you is these aha moments. Because if you're here, you're learning, you've taken the step that most people don't make. And that's all we want is for you to take those steps. So looks like we're going to be quiet in the chat, which means I might take a drink of water. Hey, hey. Send it over to you. All right. So real talk, real talk. How many of you guys and girls love selling? Uh, tell me, do you love selling? Uh, give me a score out of 10. One is like, uh, is, is I fear it and I hate it. 10 is I wake up in the morning and all I want to do is uh, sell, sell what I do to other people. Give me a score out of 10. Uh, four says Heather. Three says Maria. 10 says Allison. Rock and roll. Five says Ben. Five says Elaine. Nine says Debbie. Awesome. All right, cool. You're paying attention. You're here. You can see my screen. The second question that I want to ask you while I draw this matrix on the screen right now, whoopsie daisy, while I scroll this uh, matrix on the screen, is I want to give you a little bit of context. In which scenario do you think the seller is likely to consistently close more clients? Scenario A is we have a seasoned pro of a seller, right? A seasoned seller, uh, they've been doing it for years, but they don't have a system. So option A, seasoned seller, no system. Option B, awkward, reluctant seller with a system to sell. Who do you think is more likely to close more clients consistently? The key word is consistently. The pro seller without a system, relying all on chutzpah and flair, or the awkward shy seller who has a system to follow, A or B? Give me an answer right then and there as I write some words down. All right. This word that I'm writing here is confidence. And this here is system. Okay? Confidence and system. On the screen right now, on the screen right now, we have confidence and systems. Now, down bottom left is somebody that does not have much confidence and has no systems at all. All right, in our matrix, bottom left, no confidence, no systems. Let's come up with a name for this particular quadrant. How would you feel if you were asked to do a sales call, if you had very little confidence, you're in the wrong mindset and you had no systems? How would you feel? Right, it's time. All right, they say, Heather or Debbie or Monica or Marie, Jacqueline, it's time to do a sales call. Get on the phone call. How are you feeling right now? Deer in the headlights, failure. Do you feel confident? No. We've got the, what's the opposite of confidence? How are, you, how are you likely to feel? Someone's about to say you're about to jump on this call. Allison, I'd have to walk around to get myself in the headspace. I'll tell you how most people would feel. Are you ready? A fraud, says Marie. Most people would actually feel terror. Uh, they would feel absolute terror. Uh, they've got no confidence. They've got no systems. They're thrown into a sales call. Uh, procrastination and frightened, says Jacqueline. Yeah, this is, uh, this is absolute terror town. And uh, this is where entrepreneurs, a lot of entrepreneurial business owners begin. And that's because they have an idea. They want to launch a business. They focus on all the things that they need to do to get the business right. The website, the branding, the logo, because they want to make a difference to the world of other people. 
And then they're suddenly throw it, thrown in a scenario where they need to make a sales call or try and convince someone to buy something and they've got no confidence, they've got no systems at all, and it's terror town. Absolutely terrifying. All right, imagine that you've got confidence, uh, but you don't have a system. This is probably about 30, 40% of people. You've got confidence, you don't have a system. I asked you to score yourself a little bit earlier, and a lot of people gave me score around the five mark, and I think Heather said a four. Uh, you've got lots of confidence, but you don't have a system how would you describe that state of mind? High confidence, no systems, right? Before I said, what's more likely to sell, uh, sell consistently? The person with the uh, skills and uh, the confidence and, and uh, no systems or the person without the confidence and the systems. Um, I call this uh, little zone here, confident chaos. And I said, this is a lot of people that come into our world. More people are in the confident chaos than in the terror town, right? They might have some skills and uh, they're out there, they're doing it, they're making phone calls. Sometimes they're making a sale. More often than not, they're not. And that's because they're going at it. It's chaos. Uh, they don't have any systems to do it. Uh, some people love this and some people get off on this. And it's the dopamine hit, like a gambler. You know, it's real hit and miss. And uh, they are there out there, they are there hustling. Every day I'm hustling. That's why John's the B2B hustler. He goes out, he hustles, he figures out what's working, what's not, so you don't have to. All right, what if you've got no confidence, but you've got some good systems? Now, I don't come across many people in this particular zone anymore who are business owners. I do come across a lot of employees in this particular zone. They've got no confidence or the wrong mindset. They're not into it. They're not passionate, but they've got the systems. And what I'm going to say is that this particular matrix is called, this particular quadrant is called selling. <laughs> right? Selling is when someone gets a job, they're given the system, they sit down, they might not have a lot of confidence, uh, but however, somebody's given them a system, they've, given the, they've been given a chair and a headset and, uh, and they go out and they sell. And this is fine, the same way that confident, confident chaos, you can grow a business with confident chaos. You just only close one in five or one in 10. Selling, you might close one in four, uh, but you can also end up with some pretty poor client relationships because you might be bringing people across the line that are not ready, or you might be using pressure tactics and causing problems in the longer term. All right, so if, con if we've got Terra Town, confident chaos, and, and the bottom right-hand corner is selling, what do you think top right-hand corner is? I used this word before. Selling is, see, someone, someone typed this out for me. Thank you very much. Selling is serving. And this, my friends, is a great place to be, the serving zone. Uh, this is where our confidence is high. We're speaking with the right people. We've got our systems in place so that we can get our future customers and clients to the destination that we need to, but we don't have to feel like we're coming across as sleazy and our outcomes are consistent. Who at this moment in time feels like they might be in Terra Town? Give me a TT if you think you're in Terra Town. It's perfectly okay to admit that you're in Terra Town. It just means that you're self-aware and you're beginning to understand and appreciate what it is that you need to do. Are you in the confident chaos zone? Are you a CC? Is that you? Are you selling? Is that what you're doing right now? You're following systems, you're selling, but you're not really necessarily serving while you're doing it. Some people are saying yes, a lot of people are saying no. You're feeling a little bit slimy. Is anyone in serving town? I think there probably always is one or two people, especially those people that have been part of our world for a while. You know who you are. You've been working through our training programs. You've been listening to the things that we say and you've been applying the knowledge. You might already be in the serving. But you know what? There's one little extra place. Brilliant, lovely place. I'm going to call this the impact zone. The impact zone is amazing. The impact zone is when you are selling and in the process of selling, you are changing the lives of other people. 
If you would like to be in the impact zone, all I want you to do is I want you to type the word impact. I-M-P-A-C-T. Today you have seen a version of impact selling because John and I are sharing information. We're educating you. We're taking you on a, on a journey, but we're doing so in a way where our end goal is to introduce you to our world, to our products and services. It's wonderful because also some people are, you know, it's wonderful when you meet people in the street and they tell you about the impact that you made in their life. Um, you get emails, you get phone calls. And then of course, when someone enters your world, they can either enter in this particular state where they might feel like that they have been pressured and they're a bit of a scaredy cat client and they're not really sure why they're there or what's going on, or they can turn up in this frame of mind, excited, enthusiastic, optimistic, and ready to go. Once again, less is more. We talked about a proposal, three-part proposals or single-page proposals or, uh, or uh, having no proposal at all because you've been so clear on what it is that you're going to be helping your future clients with on the phone call or on the Zoom call or in the face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, less is more. Proposals can, you know, we, people talk about thud factor. Nobody wants thud factor anymore. Everybody wants to look at the first page and the last page. What are the outcomes? What's the price, right? Which is why the second piece of the puzzle is so important. Context, right? And information to educate. That's the pre-sales bit. That's the systems that we need. When it comes to selling, John has nine questions. And these are the nine questions that we share with our clients. And all you need to do is jump on a phone call and ask those nine questions. And if you do your job right and ask those nine questions, more often than not, there's a wonderful moment at the end where the person says, this is great. So what next? How can we continue to work together? Here's a mini case study on Intelligent Outbound uh, featuring a guy called John Weikard. So John Weikard sells a complex service. Uh, he was selling something to everyone. He didn't know whether he was AI or entrepreneur trainer or a coach or a consultant or a strategist or a technician, all this other stuff. And he came into our world. And the first thing that we did for John is we gave him a little bit of target audience clarity. The moment that he was able to identify that his business was scale ups in, this, in our startups that were scaling up, usually funded startups, life became a lot easier for John. He identified his end goal from an online perspective, which was to get to, to book a, uh, a strategy call. He didn't call it a discovery session. He didn't call it a breakthrough session. He called it a power-up strategy call. In 45 minutes, we'll work through a proven five-part formula, that's things, to identify the top opportunities for accelerating the progress of your new technology product or service. That's an outcome, right? That was his end goal. But you can't just go out to strangers and say, hey, book a strategy call with me. A lot of people won't do that. So instead, what he did is he thought, what are the headaches that this particular audience have before they know they need me? And he pulled together his five steps to stop your product sabotaging your startup, a, re a really common headache. And they were the two pieces of the puzzle that he began with. He began with the end in mind, the goal, followed by the book. Very short time later, uh, very short time later, uh, John sent us this particular message. Uh, he posted it in our Facebook group. So he said, I delivered 50 messages to 50 people on LinkedIn, nine hours ago. Seven people have contacted me through LinkedIn, six people have become leads, and one person booked a meeting with me. I went, that's fantastic, John. Keep in touch, tell me how it works out. She ordered, what? Who ordered? Of the person who booked the meeting, yeah, baby. Thanks, couldn't have done it without you, she came from LinkedIn. Uh, followed it up a message day or two later, a new client, another client. Now, the difference between the first client and the second client is that the first client, I think, was about a $10,000 order. But then we pointed out to John that if he's asking for too much too soon, they might say no. So why don't you offer to deliver a report on the first call and then introduce your $10,000 product on the second call? And he said, yeah, I'll do that. He chunked it down so he could package it back up and he offered them a $1,900 report. Second phone call, boom. Two phone calls, two clients. So he said, I got 73 leads via our LinkedIn strategies that we teach, 12 meetings booked, two sales of my core product, and I have two more decisions pending. I did that 
in two weeks. Now, it wasn't two weeks. I got to tell you, it wasn't two weeks. It was six weeks of setup and then it was two weeks of action. So it was probably eight weeks in total. But however, that's a pretty astonishing outcome in such a short period of time, particularly considering that John had no clarity about his new business that he wanted to create. And then suddenly within eight weeks, he has two big ticket clients. Guys and gals, would you like to know what technology we used to do that for John? Have you any, anyone got any ideas about the technology that we used? And would you like to see a case study like that in real time? I'm going to do it for you right now. Are you ready? I'm going to share my screen. The technology that we used is a tool called uh, B2B Dash, and you can see it on the screen right now. Uh, get B2B clients and keep them forever. Cool, right? Uh, I'm going to go to a page. This here is a, an example or a demo. And you saw these slides on the screen a little bit earlier. This is a, a lead gateway but powered by B2B Dash. How to book more conversations with very interested prospects. What best describes your situation? So what we have here is we have three questions that are not what's your first name, last name, email address, and phone number. This is a gamified form, no distractions. And we've found this in a lot of cases, in most cases, to outperform very fancy long form over-engineered landing pages, which people are a little bit over. The question is how to book more conversations with very interested prospects. What describes your situation? Most new client relationships start with a conversation. Boom. It started. I can put in my details. What happens next? Success. Pre prepare yourself for a surprise in three, two, one. There's Johnny's B2B funnel mapping session. What type of business do you have? No brainer question, B2B. I can answer some questions here. We wanna make sure that the people who are booking the call can afford us. We wanna make them aware of some of the challenges that they might have, heighten their need for us through the process of answering questions. We wanna know where in the world they're based. Great, almost done. Would I like to book a 45 minute call or a power chat? We'll just do power chat today. The form submitted successfully. Do you notice how it didn't ask me for my details again? Doesn't need to because it's all in the one tool. And then of course, great, I qualify for a power chat with John. I can book a call with him right now at a time that works out for me. I'm not gonna do it because I don't wanna clog up John's diary. Guys and gals, what happens when I book the call here? When I book the call with John, what happens next? Can somebody tell me? I book the call with John. I'm obviously gonna get the alert to say, put it in my diary, but what happens next? What's the purpose of the systems? Can you remember? It's information, it's context, and it's pre-qualify. And we can do that using this exact same tool here and now. Somebody just needs to complete that particular form and the sequence is suddenly automagically triggered so that you can build anticipation before the meeting without doing all those things that would otherwise be manual and tedious and take up your time and attention and, uh, and often send you backwards. I think I said it before, the surest way to lose a customer or client is failure to follow up. And follow up actually happens, believe it or not, follow up actually happens before the meeting. Follow up is something that happens way, way earlier than that. So this indeed is the holy grail of automation. I mean, like this is sales and marketing 101 in a digital age. Uh, whether you're prepared to accept this or not comes down to you. At the beginning, we wanna attract an opportunity. Then we wanna pre-qualify that lead. Then we wanna book an appointment. Then we wanna elevate anticipation. Then we wanna host the meeting. We wanna do the follow-up and then we wanna close and then we want to onboard. Now you might notice that this is in the shape, this is the shape of, of a grail, the holy grail. But at the same time, it is also indeed a funnel. It's got the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel. So pop quiz to make sure that you're still switched on, paying attention, pop quiz. What's the purpose of a sales funnel in your world? Is it to build trust, educate and accelerate the deal? Is it to get more done for less money? 
or is it to save you mountains of time? I want you to give me an answer. Speed, money, or time. Type one of those three words down. If you want to use automation, what's going to be most important for you? Marie, straight off the bat, says uh, time. Libby says time. Jacqueline says time. Is it to build trust, educate, accelerate the deal? We've got John here talking about his fast turnaround formula. Speed, speed, speed is money. What do they say? Is it, about, is it about getting more done for less money? Because instead of using multiple tools and uh, going broke, is it, is it uh, you know, if you're doing it manually, that's costing you a lot of time, save you mountains of time. Uh, accelerate, says Monica, that's the speed. Alison said, accelerate the deal, which reduces the time. There is no, there is no hard and fast correct answer. My personal opinion is that the most important for me is time. And the reason why I say time is the most important piece is that if I can save myself time, I can make some more money. Uh, also, if I, by focusing on the areas of my business that are going to have the greatest impact. If I save myself time, I can also find what, more ways to save myself time. I can find ways to automate what I'm doing. And when I automate what I'm doing, I can accelerate the decision. Once again, because I can invest my time and effort in areas that provide impact. Indeed, it's, it's almost, uh, it's like interest. There's a compounding effect. If I spend four hours so that I can save myself one hour every day or every week, within one day or within four weeks, I'm ahead. If I can spend four hours to save one hour a day, within four days, I'm ahead. I'm saving one hour every day. And then that frees up more time, more time, more time, more time, and on and forward we go, which is why, once again, I'm bringing it back to this particular slide here right now. When it comes to technology, there are many, many tools out there. And uh, you just need to go on the interwebs, down Facebook and down your Facebook feed. There's this tool for this, and there's that tool for that, and there's this tool for that. And I'm sure you're using some of the tools that are out there already. But what we've found is that there is, there is a dollar cost and there's a time cost. Uh, the dollar cost is that there's multiple tools. And when you're using multiple tools, that can get quite expensive. Uh, there's also the time cost because you need to learn all the different tools. Uh, and then you have to learn how to integrate the different tools using APIs and all these other different tools. In our world, as you're well aware, we have one tool that we use and recommend that was specifically developed for B2B business owners just like you. We took a step back and we said, what are all the things that our customers and clients need and want from a technology perspective? Let's pull them all together in one place. Now, if you do come into our world, here's another little bonus advantage. Most people, when they sign up for a tech tool, they sign up, it's up to you. Figure it out or don't. In our world, yeah, we actually help you out to the best of our abilities. Or as John Hutchcroft said, I've invested heaps in heaps of things in the past. You guys are by far and away the most hands-on. Uh, when you come into our world, you will score one to three setup calls within it with a human being, private. And just because you're here on this call right now with the one and only B2B hustler, John Inglesos, we'll also set you up with a B2B funnel mapping and clarity session so that you can figure out what it is that you need to do from a strategic perspective before you move on to the technology perspective. And here's why. If you have technology without a strategy, it's like having a big glistening brand new steam train without the tracks. Because a giant train is a giant piece of, a, of, of equipment it's nothing without the tracks. Once again, if you've got the tracks without the steam train, you're going to struggle as well too. So to recap and to pull together what John talked about today, I'm going to make it a little, a little bit easier for you and I'm going to pull together our signature methodology for the pointy end of the deal. And it comes down to three pieces. Are you ready? One, two, three. These are the three signature pieces. The first piece that you want to get your head around is the offer. Yes, you're going to want to get your head around the offer. And we have some steps to help you do that, starting with the three Ps, followed by chunking it down, packaging up, three-tier pricing. Then we move on to systems. The systems is the automation because systems equal sanity. That's making sure that you have a clear appointment with purpose, right? That you're using booking tools, that you're following up appropriately. And then, of course, we also have soft skills. 
And that there is what to say and do at the actual meeting itself. Now, a lot of people don't know how to handle this stuff. So they do it in a very unlinear way, bouncing from one place to the next. But no, for you, it should look something like that. And it's a process of continual improvement and refinement. Start with the offer, move to the systems, improve your soft skills. When you have those meetings, you'll be able to refine your offer, which will help you refine your systems that will help you improve your soft skills. And that there is something called the pointy end method or indeed the pointy end methodology, which is something that I'd like to introduce you to right now. Now, John and I and Simon are outrageously proud of this program that we've got called the pointy end. The pointy end is a training program that was designed to deliver three very big outcomes. It's a step-by-step -step process to help you structure your offer in ways that reduce friction. We watch people all the time pull together offers that create friction. They create barriers. Remember guys and girls, more is less, less is more. Yeah, more is less, less is more, less is more. That's what I wanted to say, less is more. It's a process designed to help you automate uh, the elevation of participation before the meeting and after the meeting, right? People think that following up is about closing the deal. Following up is about elevating anticipation. It's about the transfer of certainty. And it's to help you close better quality clients faster while eliminating the uncertainty, the second guessing, the fear-driven procrastination that unfortunately happens at the pointy end of the deal. When we're also worried that we're going to come across as having sales breath, that we end up self-sabotaging. When the reality is that when you embrace the reality that effective selling is serving, you don't have to worry about that stuff. You just follow the steps, answer, ask Johnny's nine questions, and on you go. It's also worth pointing out that this is not our first rodeo Guys and gals, boys and girls, this ain't our first rodeo. I pulled together a bunch of little mini testimonials from people that have done uh, different training programs of ours for another presentation that I pulled together the other day. But I just thought I'd throw it into this one here because we can see Kath. What does Kath say? I'm closing as early as the first call. She had her best month ever at the height of COVID while her competitors were falling apart, right? Uh, she, uh, and then a couple of months later, she had her best month again. And then a couple of months later, she had her, her best months again. Simon, what does he say? He says, this is an incredibly detailed yet straightforward methodology. Awesome. Uh, John, we helped him restructure his offer. You gave me a great tip while selling audit as a core product, then retainer for continuity. I've got two clients since the call. There were two clients that he had, two prospects that were dragging their feet. He uh, chunked it down, repackaged it back up, closed two clients. Boom, boom. Uh, who's this one here? Andre. Uh, do the exercises. Don't think too much. Just do it and you'll be richly re rewarded. Rather than just rethinking the marketing, these guys force you to reimagine how you do business. What about uh, Louise here? Last week, I got five new leads from people who opted in to get my lead magnet using my Dash Lander. And I knew that I didn't need to do a thing because my email sequence is automated in Dash. We want to make sure that you have absolutely everything that you need to succeed when you enter our world, which is why, as I mentioned before, we'll give you an opportunity to have some time with John. We'll have you give you, give you the opportunity to spend some time with Simon or a senior member of our tech crew to help you with technology stuff. We also offer weekly group mentoring calls. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world. Coral's in Canada. Fiona's in New Zealand. Uh, Hutchie's in Iowa. Uh, John, uh, Chris is in Sydney. It doesn't really matter where you are in the world. Uh, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. Yes, have you heard that Jim Rom quote? You're the average of the five people that, you've, uh, that you spend the most time with. The reality is we spend most time with ourselves talking to ourselves. And then there's our families and friends, but our families and friends don't often get what it is that we're about. It pays to have people around you that can elevate your thinking. Um, we also provide you with all the resources that you need. 
So in the context of the pointy end program, you can see on the right here that there's a process. It's not bouncing from one idea to the next. It's something that we call task attainment. <laughs> one small step at a time, right? If you've ever participated in any program before and you've invested in your education, right? Um, and then found that you didn't execute, I've got to say it's not you. It's the person who pulled together that program or product or training. It happens all the time. People pay for things and they never do anything with it. Uh, it's it's mind-blowing and it's heartbreaking. The reason why is because the person who pulled together that information thought it was enough to download their wisdom, put it in a video and share it on a website. It's not enough. No, you need to break it down into chunks that are designed specifically to get people moving forward. That's what we do. And that's why we have so many outstanding case studies and testimonials coming in uh, several times a week. Uh, and that's because we embrace a philosophy called task attainment, coupled with something called virtual butt kicking. <laughs> there you go. Or as LaDonna says, I walked away from each lesson with a piece of the process completed. Most training I've added a more attended a more theoretical. I've been poking at this stuff, but lacked structure. Thank you, James. The value of the course far exceeded the cost. Let me remind you, we want to help you kick things off in a way where you start with some focus and some clarity where you have some time with Johnny to build out what structure is going to work out best for you. What about the technology? We want to give you all the technology that you need. Now, these are the most popular tools for people just like you right now. You're going to be familiar with these tools. Maybe you're using some of these tools. And you go, you know what? I'm going to spend some money here. And I'm going to spend some money here. And I'm going to spend some money here. And I'm going to spend some money here and here. And then I'm going to spend some money here. Oh, look, there's a big one there. Yeah, that's going to cost me heaps. And what we find is that most people spend anywhere between $300 a month USD to $3,000 a month to spend some money here and spend some money here. And then there's the integration piece. Got to make sure that they all work together, <laughs> right? Then there's the time spent learning the tool. Uh, let's put some more of that. And it all adds up. Uh, on average, it seems that most people in the B2B space on average will spend about 620 US dollars. Some people are spending 300 a month. Some people are spending 3000 a month. The reality is, is that if you're not, I don't know, turning over more than $300,000 a year, it can, be, it can be difficult or a stretch to come up with the 620 US dollars every month to cover your needs. Uh, however, what I do know is that most people can reasonably afford something like 300. So we want to provide you with all the technology that you need. And indeed, B2B Dash, as I said before, does a lot of those things. Almost all of them. It's a funnel builder, right? It's a funnel builder. Why is that popping up? It's a funnel builder. It's a sales pipeline. It's a client manager. Uh, it's a time saver. Anna says, it's saving me at least 10 hours a week in admin time. 10 hours a week. How much is an hour of your time worth? Have you thought about that much? Uh, your time is precious. Your time is absolutely valuable. But unlike a lot of other technology tools out there, we go the extra mile. We believe that technology is pointless without the strategies that underpin it. We also understand that most people who are on the fence when it comes to technology is usually associated with a fear. F-E-A-R, it stands for false evidence appearing real. Some people jump onto technology, they love it. Other people are a little bit more reluctant. I'm one of those people, I hate to admit it. So sometimes we need some help. But when someone can show us how to use a tool, suddenly we look at it, we go, whoa, that's not so hard. That's actually surprisingly easy. I can do that. That's not so hard at all, which is why we always want to set you up with as much support as we can possibly provide. So what's the investment for what I'm talking about right now? Indeed, what, what am I talking about right now? Am I talking about technology? Am I talking about a training program called the pointy end? Am I talking about support? You know what? I'm talking about all three. I'm talking about making sure that you have a logical system that you can follow, okay? I want to make sure that you have a process that you can work through that starts off with the offer, 
then moves the systems, then the sale, so that you can do things in a logical order. Whereas what most people will do is they'll do this. They'll go, oh, you know what? I've got a sales call coming up. I should do the objections piece. Oh, no one's booking meetings with me, so I'll do the AWP piece. Oh, you know what? I'm not clear on my target audience. I'm going to move over here. Oh, my God, they're not buying from me. I've got to de-risk it. They're not de-risking it because I haven't packaged it up. Oh, my God, no one's turning up for my meetings. They're all ghosting me. I need to elevate anticipation. Well, if I'm going to, if these meetings are not selling, I need to do the value. <laughs> and it's a mess. That's how most people do it. It's a big, big, ugly mess. I don't want your life to be a big, ugly mess. I want it to be clean and I want it to be neat and I want it to be powerful, which is why we have a linear system, support and technology, system, support, technology it's a powerful combination which at this point in the evolution of what we're talking about i do not believe that you can find anywhere else so what is the investment what indeed is it that i'm offering you right now well we have three options yeah that's right guys and gals we have three options here's the first option the first option that we have for you is something called the complete build and the complete build is where we pretty much build the whole damn thing for you. Uh, we work with you hand in glove. It's the do it for you option, DFY option. It's built from a foundation of training. In this particular instance, the pointy end. And that there is available for $9,600. Now, when I bring up our do it for you option for $9,600 called the complete build, uh, I'm sure you guys and gals are going to have two immediate reactions. Just when I drop a number there, right then and there, I drop a number. Some people are going to be looking at that and they're going to be thinking 9,600 to get someone to do the whole thing for me, 9,600 US dollars to take that weight off my chest and come into my business and help me and support me. That's a bargain. They're going to be looking at that going, I've got quotes from agencies. Uh, I've spoken to sales trainers. If I, if I hired a staff member, it's going to take them months to, to get a result. And I'm not even going to know whether they know what it is that they're doing or not, because that's the risk. Uh, that's amazing value for money. Other people are going to be looking at it and they're going to be saying, well, you know what? That sounds great, but it's not within my reality right now. And that's something that you need to do. It's a self-assessment. You need to look at these things and go, what is in my reality right now? And that's a choice that only you can make. If it's not within your reality right now, there's another option over here, which is the training. And it's the pointy end training and it's self-paced and it's standalone. And uh, we work through the offer, the systems, the soft skills. Uh, and this is the DIY option, DIY. And that's available for $1,900. $97. Once again, outstanding value for money. Uh, if uh, you are in the B2B space and you not acknowledge and re realize that most training or support programs in this particular space are not for you, they're helping people sell $9 umbrellas, okay? Uh, they're helping people sell eBooks. But in your world, if your end goal is to sell a complex product or service that usually involves a meeting or a strategy call or a Zoom conversation, the ROI proposition is sound. It's compelling. It's very strong. The only real, real question that you need to ask at this point when it comes to this particular option is how many customers or clients would I need to sign to get ROI? And the reality is at this point in time, you might be scaring people away. We see this all the time. People, you know, they don't even know it. They're losing customers and clients left, right and center and they don't even know it because they've got an offer that creates friction. People are ghosting them on sales calls and not showing up because they haven't done their, uh, their contextual piece in advance. They get on the phone call and they act like an idiot or it takes seven phone calls to close the one deal, right? Uh, how many clients would you need to close to get ROI? One a month, two a month, three a month, right? Yeah, what if it was one client? Would you get ROI? Two clients, would you get ROI? Three clients, ROI. What about every month going forward? What about the lifetime value? As I said, it's a very strong ROI proposition. But I have a third option for you. And the third option is, are you ready? The third option is that you will get the pointy end training, which we've talked about. You will get 
the education around the offer, the systems, the 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 other the uh, the, the offer, the systems, the soft skills. You will get group mentoring calls. You will get your strategy with John. You will get. Are you ready? Your tech setup calls. You will get access to the complete B two B dash suite, all the tech tools that you need and want. And this is the do it with you option. This is the one where we work together, built from a powerful platform of education with a whole ton of support and the technology to go with it. What's the investment for this particular piece? I'll tell you what, you might be thinking it's gonna be $3,000. It's not $3,000, are you ready? So this is the training, the technology, the support, all in one place for $300 a month, minimum of six. 300 bucks. Is that within your reality? And of course, this is all in USD. Um, now, if you're interested in that particular offer, uh, Johnny is supposed to be sharing a link, but I don't think he, he knows the link. Hey, Simon, can you hear me? We've got to grab the, <laughs> the link from yesterday. Oh, you do have the offer. Uh, Simon, delete the first one. It's the wrong one. Simon's got the right, the right link. There we go. <laughs> Simon's just uh, put the right link in. Johnny's put the wrong link in. Hey, by the way, if you want to go to the first one and spend a lot more money, you can do that. Uh, pay for it uh, or pay for it up front. You can do that or you can go to the, uh, the second link that you can see on the screen right then, right now. Hey, um, guys and gals, this is James Tuckerman giving you a presentation and you may have been on any of my calls before. We've been talking about selling and we've talked about the structure of selling. What are the odds that I have a bonus? <laughs> Give me a, what do you think? Do you think I have a bonus? Yes or no? Do you, think, do you think that I have some sort of way to lift the value for you guys and gals as a special thing for you guys and gals who are on the call right now? Give me a yes or no. What do you reckon? Does James Tuckerman normally have some sort of extra, extra bonus? <laughs> is, that, is that the one? <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. As I ran through this, there was one uh, piece of the puzzle that I didn't talk about in much detail. Um, and that there is the top of the funnel. Uh, and that is because we talked about the pointy end of the funnel. We talked about what you need to do when somebody is on the hook and it's time to get that decision faster. But you probably know this already. Leads always happen before sales. So for example, if you needed to close five clients in any given month just to stay in business, just to be able to pay the rent, pay the bills, uh, pay the mortgage, all that other stuff, you had, had five, you needed five clients in any given month and you had five leads or five prospects on the hook, tell me, what are the odds of you closing all five? Five out of five is would it be 100% <laughs> that you could close five out of five? The reality is that no, you're not gonna close five out of five. And that's because one person it's not gonna be the right time. Another person is gonna go on holiday. Someone's gonna get into some awkward, ugly family dispute that you don't expect because you're dealing with humans, right? Five out of five is really, really rare. But however, what if you had five, uh, 10 opportunities on the hook. Could you close your five? Well, it'd be more likely you only had to close one in uh, half of them only. Huh. What if it was one in 15, one in three? What if you had 50 leads generating 15 meetings to get you your five? That there is a classic funnel. Sales is a numbers game. And of course, we are talking about leads before sales, which is why I've added this particular bonus today. This is, uh, this is a bonus for anyone who's interested in what I just talked about. 
uh, and um, it's our ultimate funnel fillers pack. It's a bonus set uh, where we have pulled together five of our most effective, most popular strategies for generating leads for the top of the funnel, okay? And we've got five and that's because every business is different. And that means that if you're an established business and you've got a bit of an advertising budget, you're probably gonna to wanna to go down there. If you uh, have been around the block a few times and maybe you have your own database, wouldn't it be a smart thing to do to reawaken that particular database and take advantage of the low hanging fruit? If you're a brand new business and um, you don't necessarily have a marketing budget or you might not necessarily have your own database, what about LinkedIn or strategic alliances where you leverage the audiences of other people? What if you've got a website that's just a little bit crappy? Could be using, could you, could you use it, be using that just that little bit more effectively? So I don't want to put any pressure, uh, too much pressure on you, but um, today is the last day of the summit. And uh, this is a special offer that we have put together specifically for the summit. So what I'm going to say is that uh, this particular Ultimate Funnel Fillers bonus pack is for anyone who's interested in the offer that we made just before, where you get the training, you get the support, you get the technology, um, uh, plus this Ultimate Funnel Fillers. And that there is available for anyone interested in this offer who takes advantage of the offer before the end of, before the, end of the summit. Um, however, as I said, I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but in the same breath, uh, we do have some rewards for the proactive. I love proactive people. I love working with proactive people. I love rewarding proactive people, which is why we often have rewards for the proactive before you start working with us. And even while you are working with us, the more you get involved, the more you put in, the more you will get out. So for example, Matt here. He used an expression that I loved. He said, I was muddling along. He said, it's not in the testimonial here, but he said, I was muddling along. I see a lot of people working through this sales and marketing stuff like they're walking through mud. Uh, uh, uh. Can you imagine what it, how it feels like to be walking through mud? If you've had one of those dreams where your feet just sink into the floor and you're trying to move onwards. Matt was walking through mud. He was muddling along. He applied the network reactivation strategy that I that I that is one of our funnel fillers. He said, it's now week eight. I've scored a radio interview, secured, secured two marketing partners and 19 clients. Now I need to get the business up and running. <laughs> he scored 19 clients for a business that didn't even exist. That was network reactivation from a guy that didn't even think that he had a network. Now, Elena said, what's a SMAP? That stands for Strategic Marketing Alliances and Partners. Josh in the bottom right-hand corner was getting a few referrals, but they weren't consistent. Consistency is king. We love consistency. We want consistency. Uh, he was able to create over 90 partnerships. His potential reach just went up by 90,000 people. Most people say, I don't have enough leads. There's not enough opportunities out there. I can't find the right people. James, you're telling me I need to go more narrow, but I'm struggling to get any meetings and leads at all. You're coming from a mindset of scarcity. There's opportunities out there. Like on LinkedIn, Linda says, in the last five days, my connection's more than doubled. Five days. But more importantly, your strategy has generated me a new client. That's what we want, yeah? They contacted me late last week via LinkedIn. I put a pro proposal forward to them on Monday. And yesterday, they engaged my services. This is my first stranger to customer conversion. And they came to me. Linda became the prize. It's amazing. So those there are our first uh, our top five funnel fillers. And each of these on its own uh, is available for $497, but worth a whole lot more. And that is my first bonus for anyone interested in jumping on this particular offer. But as I said, we have our rewards for the proactive. So we also have a 60 minute bonus. And as I run through this, you'll be able to see why I've chosen these specific bonuses for specifically for the most proactive people on this call right now. And I know that there are two types of people on this call right now. There are people who are participating, they're engaged, 
they're proactive, you wanna take it to the next level. And then there are people who may have been sitting in the background, quietly listening, lurking. This is your opportunity to get proactive. Uh, business as in life is not, it's not the voyeurs. It's not a passive exercise. So here's my first reward for the proactive. It's a 60 day let's stay friends money back guarantee. So if you want to jump on our offer in the next 60 minutes, in the next 60 minutes, we'll give you a 60 day money back guarantee. How outrageously generous is that? Right. Uh, and that way, if you come into our world and if it's not the right fit or if your circumstances change or, or if we think that you would be getting better value elsewhere, we will give you a full refund. We don't want people in our world that don't want to be in our world and we don't want people in our world who are not getting value. It's that simple. Uh, so if it's the wrong fit or if we think you're not getting value or if your circumstances change, you let us know you've got 60 days and we can walk away friends. There is no risk. <laughs> That's why we call this our let's stay friends money back guarantee. And it's why I'm making it the first reward for the proactive. Because I understand that there's going to be a bunch of people on this call right now who are, uh, have a business partner or a life partner, uh, or maybe they've got a chief technology officer or a senior marketing manager and they want to pull them across this stuff or a sales director. And they're thinking, oh, I want to show them this first before I make the decision. Make the decision now. You can pull this person onto your first call or two calls or whatever, and you can have this discussion. And you can take them on a journey and you can map it out together. And if it's not the right fit, you let us know and we walk away friends. De-risked. The second uh, bonus is what we call our forever NMW bonus promise. All right. This is another bo uh, bonus for the proactive. NMW stands for no matter what. If everything that I've talked about has made sense to you. So you've thought, you know what? I could go to a consultant and spend thousands of dollars, $10,000 or more on getting my offer refined and my proposals put together to win more clients or I can work through their process. If I am spending way too much time chasing clients or indeed spending way too much time coming up with rationalizations to not follow up because you're afraid of follow up, and if you're thinking about all the opportunities that you're losing, if you're thinking that your soft skills could be dramatically improved and you're thinking this sounds right and the price point is definitely within my own reality, definitely within my reality, um, as I said, sign up in the next 60 minutes and you will get the funnel fillers bonus pack, pack forever, no matter what. What I mean by that is that if you come into our world and it doesn't feel right for you, or if we don't think it's right for you for any of the reasons that I talked about before, you'll still get the bonus set for $2,485 and you'll get to have that forever. And the reason why I do that is because your time is precious. My time is precious. I don't want to waste anyone's time. And if you're going to invest a little bit of time and a little bit of trust coming into our world, I want to reward you for that. I want to reward you. I want to reward the proactive. That's what that's about. Uh, this is something that you might not have seen anywhere else. I think I only unveiled this about a week ago. Uh, we're pulling together an advanced selling via video chat, advanced selling via Zoom course. There are a lot of people out there right now that are saying, oh, I'm just going to wait for things to go back to normal. You know what? The new normal is now normal. Uh, the chaos is going to continue for years to come. Uh, also, in fact, chaos never changes. Chaos is the default state if you're in business. Um, we've been selling via Zoom and video since 2017, you know, well before the whole COVID stuff. Um, and according to a report by McKinsey, 81% of buyers, B2B buyers, 81% of B2B buyers and sellers don't want things to go back to normal. They don't want things to go back to normal. They want to be able to sell. Uh, they want people to engage them via Zoom or video chat and introduce what it is that they've got going on. Uh, so when I'm talking about advanced selling for video chat, I'm talking about selling one-to-one, one-to-many, selling with diagrams, knowing what to do with your body, how to set the scene behind you, what technology to use, all that important stuff. And we, John introduced us to Kath before. 
Now, in March 2020, that's when Kath gave us this testimonial. I'm closing as early as the first conversation. It used to take four or five conversations. I just had my best month ever. She used to do her conversations in coffee shops. Plus, I signed my first international client. Borders have become meaningless. My potential client base has exploded. And that is because she learned to sell via video chat. It's one of those skills that we weren't raised with but it's something that's going to define how successful you are at selling for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's bold. It's a big claim, big deal. So let's make this happen. As I said, if you're interested in taking advantage of that particular offer, hit the link that's somewhere on the screen right now. And uh, just to really summarize it for you once again, we are talking about three big areas to sign off on the offer, the systems, the soft skills. Plus we wanna make sure that you have the tech pieces and Johnny introduced five little arrows here, plus the support, which we kick things off with a bit of one-on-one -on -one support, but then we also have our group mentoring calls and an amazing community, tick, tick, tick. <laughs> less is more, less is more. Uh, and as I said, if I wanted to distill this down into three things, we're talking about strategy, support, technology, and it's a powerful combo that, we won't find, that you will not find anywhere else. So guys and gals, we've hit the two hour mark. We've uh, in about one or two minutes, we've hit the two hour mark. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your uh, active participation. I want to thank you for getting so involved. I want to thank you for making events like this so much fun for, for John and myself. I also want to thank you for deciding to invest in you and your business uh, by setting aside a little bit of time. I hope that there are key principles that are gonna settle in your brain. They're gonna, gonna help you today, tomorrow, this week, this month, even in 12 months, 12 years from now, I want you to be able to look back and think, yeah, selling is serving. And I remember when I made, when that epiphany happened. Uh, um, yeah. I want to thank the people who have who've, uh, jumped on our opportunity. I know that Jacqueline was presented with this opportunity on Tuesday. She's here with us now. Left a comment just then for all panelists. Uh, she jumped on that opportunity. I also see some, some familiar names of people who are already part of our world, like Alison uh, and some other ones as well too, Fiona. Um, and I want to congratulate you guys and girls in particular, because I said at the very beginning, only point... 0.1% of business owners invest in their education. Isn't that crazy? Does that not blow your mind? What that means is that what that means is that all the other 99.9% .9 of people are learning on the go. They are winging it. They are working through the process in their own time in their own way. And they are learning from their own. Uh, they are learning from their own mistakes. Johnny and Glacius, come back on the call. Yo, yo! All right, Johnny and Glacius is the B two B hustler, and he's the B two B hustler because he goes out and he hustles and he tries things and he experiments. Sometimes it works out really well. Sometimes he gets punched in the nose. But when he learns what's working and what's not working, he can come back and he can bring it into your world yeah <laughs> he just says yep yeah all right yeah. well i've been there you know uh yeah you make mistakes but uh let me make the mistakes to work out the solution then pass that information on to you so that you don't have to worry about making the same screw-ups that i've made and wouldn't and, it be uh, and wouldn't it be really helpful if you could talk about what you do and how you do it and how you present it to someone like john rather than a client you know, uh, there are a reason why actors rehearse in, you know, re rehearse off stage before they have an audience. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason why, you know, singers craft 
their their singing talent before they go into a studio uh, or before they jump onto a stage. Uh, they do it with uh, with other people. Um, Mark says investing in education doesn't surprise me. Dealing with corporates, their training budgets are less than one percent of payroll. So a business owner being 0.1% means that those who educate clearly have a much larger chance of success. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, I think in this last 12 months, we would have invested at least uh, 1% to 4%, 5% of uh, turnover in our education. I'm not... Uh, a lot more. You think so? Yeah. All yeah. right, okay. No, no, it's not. No, it'll be somewhere, somewhere between the two. Anyway, it's a, a, lot, of, a, lot, a lot of coin. It's about 5%. You know, it's about 5% of, of everything we earn goes back into our own education. Yeah. You know, very okay. good reasons. You're probably right. You're probably right. Um, all right, so it's time to go. Once again, I want to thank you guys and gals. I want to thank you guys and gals for participating in the summit, for being part of the B2B summit. Uh, for the guys and girls who are already part of our world, the Dash users who are on the call, the B2B school members who are on the call. Um, if you're a B2B school member and you want to use Dash and you're not using Dash yet, obviously reach out. Um, if you're part of our world for the first time, please do leap on this opportunity. As I said before, it's not our first rodeo. Uh, we work with a lot of people and have for a really long time. Um, and uh, the pointy end was first developed, I think, four or five years ago. Uh, it's been refined and finessed over a really long time so that you can focus on the 20% of things that are going to have the biggest impact rather than the 80% of things that are distracting you right now that have almost no impact on your business. All right. So just a couple. Uh, so we'll say goodbye. Just a couple names that I can see. Alison, Elaine. Thank you, Elaine, for being so proactive today. Fiona, Jacqueline, Josh. Uh, let's look. Walter, Peter, the other Peters, uh, Paul, Peter, Paul, Mark, Paul, Peter, Peter, Peter Piper. There's, there's actually on my screen, I see two Marks and uh, Paul and a couple of Peters. Right? Is it? Yeah. Is that the Peter? Where's Mary? <laughs> awesome. Uh, and I just want to throw this down before you hit the leave button, before James hits the end call. I want you to look at it this way. If you've got technology and you've got systems and you've got the tools, fantastic. What you've got is a Formula One car. Here's the problem with that if you have a Formula One car, and all you know how to do is ride a bicycle, you're not going to get very far. On the flip side, if you've got all the know-how, all the expertise, all the education, all the, the, the books, the courses, but you've got no technology, it's like knowing how to drive a Formula One car, being faster than Michael Schumacher, but you can only ride a bicycle for the rest of your life. And if you've only got support, it's like having your mum tell you while you're at home on the PlayStation, good job, son, good job, daughter. <laughs> so what we're really talking about here and the reason we came up with this offer is the intersection of all three. You will not find this anywhere. If you're on the fence, take action. You got the 60 days, but let us show you what happens when you pull strategy, technology and support together. Because I think we've got the testimonials to prove that it works pretty well. So that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, we've 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 de we've de risked it for you as well too, which is one of the things that we are, that we obviously teach in our training as well yeah. too. Uh, rock and roll. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, guys and gals. Thank you for the thank yous. This has been one of those days, John. I don't know if you've noticed it, but everybody's typing into all panelists, not all yeah. panelists and attendees. <laughs> it's never so happened. By the way, this is a regular thing, which means that it's no, which means that it would have been a fairly weird experience for you guys and gals because we're watching people leave comments just for us, not, not for everybody else. You know I, mean, what? I wonder uh, if it has to do with this whole change with the recording. Well, like, you, the, it's a, oh, you it's know what it looks like on the other side. Simon might have to tell us what it looks like on the other side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's watching it. See, Jacqueline just said, yes, I just only realized there is another option. Yeah, yeah, Jack says, yes, it's all for, different. For all there you go. Anyway. All right, time to go. Have a great day. Uh, make sure you take advantage of that particular option. Your time is precious. Your future is precious. Um, I just realized that I actually even set aside, I actually set aside another, I could set aside, an, I actually set aside another seven minutes. Um, can I try a thought exercise, John? A thought exercise that I've been meaning to try forever. And this could go really badly. But I want to try it. Go. Yeah. 
If it goes badly, we just edit it out of the equation. I'll man. just I'll quickly end the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, I have a look at this. All right. This is for the stayers, and there's not a lot of you. The moment we hit the two hour mark, we just sort of, people, you know, either paying and evaporating, signing up and evaporating, or just evaporating. But um, hey guys and gals, this is this is a real question. If I offered you two thousand dollars to take a year of your life, would you take me up on my offer? Two thousand dollars to take a year. I want to buy a year from you for two thousand dollars. Give me a yes or a no, and maybe see if you can figure out how to use the chat tool in a way where other people can see. Yeah, Mark says no. Jackie says no. For me, it's come a, on. It's two thousand dollars. It's just a year. You got you, you know the average human's probably got like no. seventy. Oh, says Elaine. Oh, come on! All right, cool. All right, <laughs> all right. Now let's now let's do some weird maths. And as I said, this is the first time I've ever done this, and I might get it and, and I might get it wrong. All right, according to people out there, there are lots smarter than me. The average business owner can complete only four meaningful tasks in any workday. Now I've said that to business owners, and they'll say, oh, "I get a lot more done than that." until we ask them to audit how they spend their day. And then they realize there's a lot of tasks that they do that are not meaningful, right? But most people can really only get about four meaningful tasks done in any given day. Four. I'm gonna, uh, Johnny, how's he maths? All right, so if there are only four tasks in any given day, how many tasks can we get done in a week? 20. Five times four. All right, all right, okay, great. 20 a week. All right, uh, let's say that there are 50 working weeks in a year. There are indeed left, less than that. How many tasks is, tasks is that in a year? 20 times 50. 1,000. 1,000. Yeah, yeah, you had to think about it. <laughs> well, that's all right. I'll tell you what, when he's at the pointy end of the call, his maths brain goes crazy. When, it, when, it, when a deal is about to be struck, he can, he can come up with all sorts of plans and structures to, to get the deal. So that means that there are really only 1,000 tasks that we can get, given, get done in any given year. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the picture for you for the next three years of your life. It's a bold thing to be thinking about. Three years of your life. And here's the reality once again. They're supposed to be a third. Most people spend two thirds of their time on things that don't propel their business forward. Now, if I can break this down and, a re and you really began to think about it, you would agree. And because there is time spent procrastinating there is time spent second guessing. There is time spent on a bus or in your car or on a train to meet someone in a coffee shop to try and sell them on, the, on, on a product or service that could have been sold over Zoom or the telephone. There is the second call. There is the third call. There is the fourth call to get the deal. There are all sorts of different things. There is the guy that you come across on Facebook that suddenly tells you that all you need to do to solve your problems is invest in search engine optimization. But you're in B2B and your customers don't even know what they're looking for. There's the person that tells you that you need to build a new website for your brand new business. The reality is all you need is a lead gateway and a LinkedIn page. There are all these paths that you go down on where you're wasting your time and you're heading off in all these different directions. And then there is the 30% of your time where you're getting the good stuff done. All right, what if I was just to take all that and I was to take all those different three pieces, all the good stuff, and what if we worked really hard to give you some priority and focus and did our best to drag three years into one by helping you focus on just the things that count. Now, a moment ago, I gave you an option and I said, with $2,000, can I take a year from you? And you all said, no. For $2,000, can I give you two? For $2,000, can I give you two? Uh, <laughs> time is the most valuable and precious thing that you have. 
And John and I spend our time getting frustrated with people making poor decisions, making the same mistakes again and again and again and again, investing in websites they don't need yet, in SEO they don't need yet, signing up for some Facebook group course when they should be focused on LinkedIn, for suddenly getting distracted by jumping on TikTok because it's the hottest new thing. There is a limited number of hours in your day. There's a limited number of times that you can do. Help us help you accelerate the journey. Now, as I said, this was a little bit of a mental game that I'd never done before. What I also just want you to observe is that what I was doing there is I was handling an objection. And the objection is I don't have enough time to do your training. I was handling an objection and I was doing it with a diagram. Would you like to get better at this stuff? I hope you will, because that there is an example of the advanced selling via video chat that we're including as the bonus in today's training. What did you think of that, John? You've never seen me well, do that. I, I tell you what, we've spoken about it, but yeah. I haven't seen you do it. And you even had me going, oh, by the way, I think I only get one meaningful task done a day. So, you know, what does that say? You only get what? I, I reckon I only get one meaningful task done a day. So what does that say? <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, I tell you what, I would never let you, you could not buy a year of my life for 30,000, but I would gladly spend 50 grand for you to give me the next two or three. If I was on my deathbed and I needed an extra three, I'd spend 50 grand. Yeah. But we don't look at the world this way when it comes to our, our time and managing our own time. And I said it earlier is Absolutely. that humans don't value their own time the way that they should. Only the most elite of thinkers uh, view the world this way. And uh, they're the ones that, um, and they're, they're the ones that uh, experience ex extreme growth in their professional and personal lives. Uh, Bill Gates apparently is one of the most punctual people that you will ever meet. He ne he's, he's never late almost never late. And the reason why is that everything is planned out and it's scheduled out because the only thing that he cares about now is how much time he has left. Yeah, he doesn't need anything else. He's got billions of dollars. Mm. That's all he needs. Uh, cool. Uh, Jacqueline says, have you seen the jelly bean video on our time? Very confronting. I haven't, I'll have to go track that down. Uh, and the next time I do a presentation like this, you'll watch me Drawing colorful jelly beans. Yay! To go in the jelly bean jar. I just wanted to draw something. All right, it's time to go. Uh, thank you for hanging out with uh, John and I for that extra couple minutes there for allowing me to experiment with, a, uh, with an objection handling technique using diagrams and drawings, even despite the fact that you can't read my handwriting, that it's absolutely terrible. Um, Elaine, that was worth the stay. Thank you very much. Elaine's also leaving comments just for us. I think Elaine's the most proactive participating person today, but only we've got to see it, but we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. All right, cool. Time to go. Have a great day, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the summit. Uh, have a great night if you're in North America, uh, if you're in America or Canada. Um, rock and roll. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the people who are already part of our world. Uh, thank you to the people who have, who have uh, already, who, who took us up on our, on our offer to become, oh, what are, our, uh, the B2B pro bundle. Could you tell that it was a special offer for the summit? I couldn't remember the bloody name. The B2B <laughs> pro bundle <laughs> offer, right? So if you want to take advantage of that offer, please do so because it's unlikely that you're going to find it anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> So good, James. Thanks for the priceless bonuses, the Pro B2B bundle. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> All right. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great night. Uh, see you on Facebook. See you on our calls. And see you to those extra special people who are already part of our world or just became part of our world just now. All right. Bye, Johnny. See ya.